Welcome to BizTech Forward, your go-to podcast for cutting-edge insights at the intersection of business and technology. Join us as we explore the trends, innovations, and strategies shaping the future of the digital world. Let's move forward together. Hello, and welcome to BizTech Forward, the podcast where we delve into the world of technology and business with some of the brightest minds at Datart. I'm Ani from the Media Relations team, and I actually get to work with these brightest minds every day. So think of me as your friendly tour guide as we discuss the past, present, and future in tech. Today, we're kicking off our very first episode with a fascinating topic, AI in automotive. So we're literally going to talk about how AI is driving the future. <laughs> and our guest today is Dmitry Bagrov, the Managing Director of Datart UK. Hi, Dmitry. Hi, Annie. It's a pleasure to be here. Dimitri. If you, could, if you could introduce me to those bright minds, that would be very useful. <laughs> Dimitri um, has loads of experience in actually running the software company, in dealing with clients, and he actually often comments on tech trends for various media. So, Dimitri, again, welcome to the show and thank you for being here. We will try to break our discussion down between like past, present and future. So Dmitry, let's start with the past, obviously. How did we get here? Like, would you give us a little background on how did we actually arrive at the current trends in automotive? Like what key developments would you highlight? Certainly. Um, so first the earth cooled down and then the dinosaurs appeared and then the meteor struck and then the dinosaurs obviously died and they turned into fossil fuels. And that was the beginning of the automotive industry. Uh, but uh, actually, AI in um, automotive is not a very recent invention. Actually, artificial intelligence um, has been around for quite some time now, at least in theoretical form. And uh, the first types of AI uh, that appeared uh, in cars actually date back to 1950s. Uh, realistically, the first artificial intelligence that was introduced into cars was uh, cruise control. And uh, it was obviously getting better and better uh, as the computational power of the chips that could be used in cars increased. Um, the cars got um, ABS, um, anti anti-lock braking systems, uh, they got uh, driver, various driver uh, assistance systems like lane assists, which also date back, actually more than 30 years back to the early 90s. Uh, but the real sort of AI, the real game changer came in the early 2000s uh, when computer vision and data processing allowed uh, more sophisticated equipment uh, to be installed in cars. So the um, things like uh, adaptive cruise control uh, and uh, true lane keeping assistance where the computer actually analyzes visual input and is capable of making decisions based on that input uh, was a real game changer. Uh, DARPA, uh, which is an American uh, agency as far as I remember, um, had a grand challenge in 2004 uh, where they wanted to showcase the potential for, to for autonomous vehicles. And that was, that was an event that gave um, a big push uh, to all things AI in uh, automotive. Oh, in 2004, like 20 years ago. 20 years ago, yes. And that is the DARPA Grand Challenge. Gr DARPA Grand Challenge. Huh. Google it up. I couldn't be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of uh, challenges, but other kind of challenges, would you also comment maybe on uh, some of the actual breakthroughs and challenges that have influenced the development of AI in automotive? Um, I think um, the biggest challenge the, uh, is, is, is actually something that I already mentioned. is It's the analysis of data, uh, visual data or... Um, environment data, if, if we if we describe it in uh, in a sort of a more general sense, um, the um, 
um, the, the vehicles now equipped not just with cameras, they also have LIDARs, they have uh, radars, all that data needs to be analyzed and decisions need to be made based on that. That includes very fast data processing. It, 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 you should be able to uh, operate uh, data on vehicle because you obviously cannot rely on data transfer for split second decisions. Um, machine learning, particularly deep learning, is a, plays a very important role. So all of that um, took us to the point when um, regulatory uh, organs, uh, bodies, uh, started messing around with uh, autonomous driving, which actually is a good sign because uh, from my point of view, whenever regulations appear in something, it means it's mainstream enough to be dangerous. Uh, so it's a good sign. Uh, while autonomous driving was confined to labs and uh, test tracks, there was no need to regulate it. Uh, when it actually spilled out on the streets, obviously there is a need to regulate it and create some um, certifications and uh, uh, other nice bureaucratic things. Um, the... Um, Another breakthrough is um, was actually spurred uh, by not cars, uh, but uh, more smart devices at home, which is um, basically IoT, Internet of Things. The um, need to get data from other cars or other players, let's say, on the on the road um, was always there. But uh, once it was clear that the methods used in uh, smart devices at home uh, for communicating with each other can actually be used for cars to get for them to get information from their environment, uh, that was another major bre breakthrough. Of course, it meant additional data, and of course, it meant uh, the need to change drastically the way cars are uh, viewed by their manufacturers. Because if previously car was mostly an engine with uh, with a chassis and uh, you know wheels and uh, the uh, autonomous driving element with two legs and sometimes two legs and then two arms uh, somewhere in, in it. Uh, now it's actually a software defined vehicle uh, and uh, it is defined by the software that runs on it. Speaking about AI, one of the, I think, um, maybe less noticed things is the growth in uh, exponential growth in um, computational capability. So the chips that are currently used in cars, um, I think I have, I had the, I had the numbers, um, uh, I read them somewhere very recently. So I think where previously it was 30 to 60 different uh, chips, different little computational units in the car doing all of this stuff around it. Now we're down to four or five. Yay. So that means the capacity grew significantly. And that actually opens up a lot of interesting possibilities and a lot of very scary possibilities as well. Yeah. You know what I wonder? Because you did mention sales and it is still um, data art that we are both, you know, kind of uh, related to. And I kind wonder... of, sort of, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just wonder, say somebody stops you uh, um, on a street in London somewhere and they just randomly say, hey, Dmitry, but um, quick question, how are companies like data art contributing to, you know, such advancements? Uh, what would you say? I'm just curious. Well, for the first, the first question would be, who are you and how do you know me? Because <laughs> I'm not a celebrity and people don't stop me on the street. Um, but Wait, uh, or... what we do, um, I think um, one of the most interesting things that we can do is, um, and, and, and do actually with um, some of our clients, is 
bringing the understanding of how the wider IT infrastructure should be uh, created for certain things to work properly. Because if you look at it, um, there's something very tectonic is currently happening in the automotive industry, which is, it, it, it's, it's, it, I did start with dinosaurs yeah. and, and then the meteor. So AI is basically a meteor crushing the dinosaurs at the moment because automotive industry is a very conservative industry. Uh, the cycle of development of a new model is calculated in years, if not in tens of years. If you see a new model going out, it means they started developing it five or six years ago. Yeah. Five or six years ago, in IT terms, is ancient history. So we are currently on iPhone 15, just about to be, um, iPhone 16 is about to be launched. Okay, so let's say iPhone 15, five generations back, that's iPhone X. Yeah. The very different things. Okay, aesthetically, computational power, cameras, anything. A lot of the things are very different. So five years is a very long time in technology. So what is happening in, in the automotive industry now is they need not just to introduce technology, more technology in or into, into their cars. They actually need to change their entire process, how they do things. They no longer, for example, can develop the engine, the chassis, the you know the uh, the interior, the exterior for for four years, and then the last year just tell the software developers, you know, you know they, they, there you go, that that's the that's the car you're going to be powering. Just write us a software. It doesn't work that way anymore. So IT has to be involved. IT in in our sense of the word. Technology has to be involved from the very beginning. The cycle has to be much shorter. The Chinese manufacturers understand that really well. They churn out new models, not every five years. They do it much quicker. So the the Western manufacturers, the European, the German ones, the American ones, they're actually facing, I would say, existential crisis at the moment because on one side, they face competition from the Chinese can do the same that they can do, but 10 times faster. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, they no longer can continue doing what they have been doing because everyone expecting different. So that, that is, um, that is where data art, I think can be very useful because we understand the overall technology life cycle. We understand how technology should be approached as part of a larger thing. So that it works. Yeah, and we are fast. Speed, speed, speed. Some sometimes. So <laughs> speed is not the most important quality in development. Any builder will tell you that. Because the most important quality is the most important quality is quality. It has to work. There's only there's only it's a it's a binary system. It's ones and zeros. Either it works or it doesn't. Uh, it works. Where, 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 where a lot of people, what a lot of people don't get is something that worked before in one context, taken out of it and moved to another environment wouldn't work. So it's very subjective. And that means, I mean, that's, that's, that's really good news for us because it means even if we did something, we might do it again and again and again for a different environment. Well, not to brag too much, but uh, at data art, it works. So, <laughs> um, most of the time, <laughs> um, this was a little, uh, good little bridge to, I think my, uh, favorite part, Dimitri, the, 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 the third part is about the future. So, uh, I would like us, or I would like you to predict the future, please. Uh, where where are we going? Dimitri? Boring, boring. <laughs> um, which version of the future you want? The utopian the, or dystopian? The optimistic one. The optimistic. Realistic. Okay. No, let's, let's okay. Be unrealistic. Okay. Let's let's stick with moderately optim optimistic then. Okay. <laughs> so um, I think um, 
I think, um, as I said, I think we're on the uh, um, on, on the point when the automotive industry is transforming, and uh, give it another five, ten years, uh, it will be very different. Uh, we'll first of all we'll see a lot more autonomous vehicles, um, particularly in in the cities, in urban areas, or in the situations where the uh, route is predictable. So buses, uh, taxis, to a certain extent, uh, trains. Don't forget about trains because as DLR, DLR has proved it many years ago that you can right. actually have autonomous trains. Um, so we'll definitely see a lot more of that. We'll see a lot more of uh, alternative um uh, let's put it alternative fuel type vehicles or so electric vehicles, obviously maybe hydrogen cells, um, something else because fossil fuels are a finite resource and uh, it would be good to have something else um, available. And again, I think um, ideal testing ground for things like that is the public transport. Yeah. Because if you think how many diesel engine buses are there in London and uh, what kind of uh, pollution they make, even with all the regulations. And if you replace all of them with electric vehicles, electric buses, it would be big win. And then buses are very predictable. They have a route, they have, uh, they have a depot, they start at the same point, they finish at the same point. They, they pretty much do exactly the same thing all the time. They need to react to traffic, that's true. Uh, but, uh, I mean, <clears throat> as Tesla and uh, other manufacturers, BMW, Mercedes, Audi, already proved, the um, reaction is not really something impossible. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's one thing. Um, what else? Anything, anything, anything that comes to mind that you think might cause like a real revolution or something? Something revolution. Like the wow effect, you know? Aliens coming to Earth. That would be a revolution. Relating, relate, related to AI and cars and automotive. Aliens coming in little cars <laughs> coming to Earth. Okay, good enough. Uh, yes. Um, but no, I think. Um, Processing power is uh, is important. So if uh, quantum computing finally goes mainstream, apart from all the horrific problems it's going to create for cryptography, it would actually allow for much faster computation on board. Uh, so that would be, I think, that would be a major driver for um, for for the. Um, uh, for the autonomous vehicles, for uh, vehicles controlled by AI. Um, flying cars, Back to the Future promised us flying cars, what, 30 years ago? Okay. Still nowhere near. But I think uh, small aviation is uh, neglected and, and it's quite unfair. Uh, because if you think of it, the, uh, if you, if you, even in, even in the UK, if you go back to sort of 1950s, 1960s, the small aviation back then here was a lot more, uh, a lot a lot more developed. Uh, so small air taxis were around. The people could fly from I don't know from Birmingham to Oxford in I don't know how long is that? A couple of hours. Yeah. The the you know driving would take you at least four. And uh, so I think, um, I actually think that um, the most interesting application for autonomous driving and AI on board is not the vehicles that would be driving on, uh, on the ground. It's the vehicles that would be flying. Well, Basically, um, I, I read an article some time ago, uh, which was uh, trying to analyze why the uh, small aviation didn't really take off, so to say. And uh, the answer was that uh, as the traffic grew, 
humans just are not reliable enough to think very quickly in three dimensions. Yeah. Uh, in two dimensions, yes, and confined within the road, yes, and we still have a lot of accidents, and unfortunately, we still have a lot of people dying on the roads. Uh, but add another dimension to it and remove the roads, the confines of the of the actual tarmac, and you have a disaster waiting to happen. So the um, AI on board is actually, I think, there not for the for the ground vehicles. It's there for the flying cars and the uh, whatever else. It's going to be flying chairs, flying <laughs> cub- cubicles, flying meeting rooms. We shall see. Well, hopefully, but that's not five, ten years. I think that's more like ten, fifteen at least. Oh, we shall see. Still, <laughs> Dmitri, I I did say it to, about this part that it was going to be my favorite, but I take it back because this next part is actually my favorite. And you keep changing your mind. And, <laughs> but I mean it this time. It's like this uh, quick quick bonus segment. Let's say it's a bonus, uh, but like to to spice things up a little bit. I want you to give us and to to give our listeners um, three unpopular opinions that you have about AI and automotive. Go. Uh, You always ask me to do the nicest things, Andy. (laughs) Um, Okay. Um, Cars will make us lazy. Autonomous cars will make us lazy. Uh, We'll all turn into... People from uh, Wally, you know, the mm-hmm. uh, morbidly obese, fat people who don't do anything themselves and drive around in little tiny chairs. Uh, and uh, I think as uh, apocalyptic as that uh, looks, I'm pretty sure it will happen, uh, but probably not on the massive scale. Um, probably, as always, with any uh, with any invention, there will be people who just take it to absolute maximum, and uh, you can't really do anything with it. Me. Mm. Um, my personal favorite is that uh, <laughs> the AI will actually take proper backseat driver position in your car. Expanding from take the next left to you forgot your breakfast. Okay. And, and uh, it might actually happen because if you look at the way the assistants, uh, various AI assistants are evolving, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the way, for example, ChatGPT 4.0 can talk, uh, simulate emotions, uh, break, make pauses, stutter, it actually can fool pretty conveniently, pretty pretty convincingly, uh, and anyone that they're talking to a person. So I think it's we're not yet at the stage when AI would pass Turing test, but we're very close. And uh, I'm pretty sure at some point AI will just uh, start nagging you. You're going too fast. Slow down. You already had three fines this month. Oh, You're going over your budget, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that should be a kill switch. I should be able to switch it off. <laughs> and um, but I, I, honestly, I don't think that realistically is going to happen. I, I, maybe as a joke, like, you know, like Tesla can play something stupid using the car horn, but not, uh, not on a massive scale. What I think definitely is going to happen is that AI in cars will be just another channel for sales. So Mm. your car basically would know, it's just another source of data about you and it will be able to transfer that data to whoever pays for it. And uh, it will be selling you stuff. So it will be selling you, I don't know, latest vacuum cleaners from Dyson or ergonomic seat cushions or yet another charger for your iPhone. Nobody needs billboards when you actually have your dashboard as an advertisement space. And unfortunately, I think that is definitely going to happen. Oh, no, we we cannot afford buying more stuff, Dmitry. 
Well, if you cannot afford buying more stuff, don't buy more stuff, but you will still be bombarded by the, uh, by the advertisement. Wow. Dmitry, thank you so much for talking to us today. I actually really enjoyed our conversation. It was really interesting. Um, thank you. Always and, a pleasure. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in to this Tech Forward, to our very first episode. So exciting. Please stay tuned for more because more is coming. And we also want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on AI and automotive? Do you have a popular or unpopular opinion of your own? Please send us an email at bistechforward at datart.com. And in the meantime, drive safe. Thanks for listening to Biztech Forward. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast to stay updated on the latest in business and technology. Join us next time for more insights and forward-thinking discussions. Presented by DataArt.